let's see, is this working? No. Oh, okay, it's working. So whether you like machine learning or not, or whether you're more skeptical, um, you know, we already see a lot of useful applications coming out that use machine learning, but um, there are a lot of medical imaging applications. Um, like traffic prediction is super popular in uh, in navigation apps, uh, text translation, grammar checking, fraud de detection. So a lot of the credit card transactions are now uh, checked using some machine learning algorithm, spam detection, and so on. And 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 the number of of applications keeps uh, expanding. Uh, and but this comes at the expense of a lot of competition, um, a lot of competing resources. So in this graph, we see uh, the state of the art models that were produced, you know, in the past like decade, and uh, and this graph shows the number of flops required to train each of these models. And what we observe is that the number of of flops has been doubling every three point four months. Uh, which is <laughs> but a lot, right? So, um, and and of course, hardware is not improving nearly uh, at this speed. Actually, it never was. Right? Um, and this graph only shows the training, like the competing demand for training it does not show the competing demand for inference because we don't really have data on how much, how many kind of inference queries companies are doing. But you can imagine that there's also Growing like crazy because um, the difference now everywhere uh, on the phone, on the TV, on all servers, um, etc. So, uh, so this kind of means that we really need to make machine learning super efficient. Um, so I'll assume that the audience doesn't know much about machine learning uh, and how it, it it's developed. But the key point to know is that people use um, some framework <coughs> to, to develop these models. For example, you may have heard about TensorFlow. Essentially, is a library on top of Python. And these first generation frameworks, um, they were quite complicated to use. So you almost needed a PhD in compilers to to use um, these frameworks. Because, for example, doing an operation like addition did not do an addition straight away. So uh, addition operation would generate an AST, right? And then at the end, after generating the full uh, data flow graph for, for the model, then you, you could call the compiler and execute the, the model. So doing debugging on these kind of systems is really hard. Like the even just type mismatches get delayed until uh, the model is is running. Like they are not even caught at compilation time. So it's is these frameworks were really hard to use, and that's why now the popular ones, the, the so-called eager mode or imperative. Frameworks like PyTorch, TensorFlow 2, um, use a more natural semantics, I guess, are like more similar to other programming languages where, you know, if you have an addition, it actually means you run the addition straight away. Right. So it's a much easier programming model, much easier to debug. You can print expressions whenever you want. Uh, it's all beautiful. Of course, there's always a catch, and that's why we are here. But um, you know, these kind of uh, of frameworks are much much easier than the previous generation. They are still complicated. <laughs> Don't get me wrong. So we are not there yet to say that this is the last. Uh, this is the final word on how a, a machine machine learning model should be developed. But it's much better than what it used to be, you know, like ten years ago. Um, so. I'll start by just showing you a very simple program in uh, PyTorch. So, um, uh, so what this 
two first lines do is that they uh, create new tensors. Uh, in this case, they are two by two tensors, so they are essentially matrices, right? And they create the tensors with some some data. Okay, and then yeah, on this line we we multiply them and we add this one with the underscore. Uh, it, it means it's an in place operation. So we we replace the contents of x with the result of x plus z. Okay, and finally we print the result of the addition here. Okay, so with TensorFlow, um, you could not do this print here because x was only uh, and it was a AST, right? Not the result of the operation itself. Okay, so if you run this this program, you you get the tensor, and, uh, you know, the matrix uh, that is the result of the operations with it. So it's essentially what you would expect. Unfortunately, uh, these frameworks are pretty slow. So let me show you the overhead. <laughs> so consider that we have our you know, GPU. Most people use GPUs. Um, so when you do the move, right, then we go to the GPU. The GPU computes the resulting tensor. Then we come back to the Python. And Python goes back to PyTorch, which goes to the GPU, computes the get the result, comes back, and so on and so forth. And when we go to the print, the GPU does not know how to print tensors. So actually, it needs now to transfer the data to the CPU RAM, which then um, prints the result. Okay, so. I hope this slide confesses that the efficiency of these kinds of frameworks is not is not correct. Um, like the latency of going back and forth to a GPU is horrible, right? So it's not the same as going to a CPU. It's it's way way worse. Um, and also the other thing is um, usually combining operations is where you get most of the um, uh, most of the speed up. So you really want for example, uh, in this case, this addition can be made free uh, if uh, if merged with the multiplication, okay? because uh, um, you can combine the two operations efficiently. But like this, with the straight execution semantics, you cannot really combine the operations. So, all right. So these kind of frameworks users love them, but they're not very efficient execution. <clears throat> and so, uh, engineers, of course, uh, solve the problem the way they can, and so they come up with a bunch of hacks to improve efficiency. Um, one of them is, for example, to have views. Um, for example, transpose is not really a transpose, right? So it the transpose only creates a view. Uh, so it can be surprising that when you change uh, Z here, um, you also change X, right? because uh, Z is just a view over the data of X. And with in-place operations, we have, at least we have the underscore to let us know, okay, this, is a, this doesn't return a new tensor, but with views, there's no warning. So you need to remember which operations are views and which are, are not, and it's not always obvious. One of the reasons that transpose is not materialized is that transpose fuses super well with matmul. Like you usually, you want one of the operands of matmul to be tra transposed. Right? So it would be a shame if we had materialized the transpose just to realize that, oh, now I'm doing a matmul and now I need to tra transpose it again. So um, that's one of the reasons that <coughs> no one really likes to to materialize the transpose. Another hack is that these frameworks, of course, then start uh, offering like macro operations, which are combinations of uh, two, three uh, of the smaller operations. Uh, right now, 
PyTorch has about uh, two, has over 2,000 operations, the API, um, and CUDA is going the same way. So you know, PyTorch compiles down to CUDA, right? So CUDA is also essentially trying to offer all two and three. Um, so combinations of, of two and three uh, operations, right? So that users can just call um, these micro operations. But then you know, the users need to remember all these 2,000 operations, which is, uh, is, is not easy. The, and this list keeps growing. So it's not fixed. Every new version of PyTorch, which comes, comes out every six months, um, you know, keeps increasing the list of operations. So I don't, it's pretty hard to, to keep up to date. But nevertheless, it's a good trick in a sense that you reduce the overhead per operation because now we have much larger operations, so you don't notice the overhead as much. Okay, so now I want to go a little bit more technical and show what's going on inside PyTorch. Very few people know about this, uh, including all the machine learning researchers, because they usually they stay above PyTorch, they don't know exactly what's going on inside. So you, you'll be one of the 10 people in the world that know about this in the next five minutes. Um, okay, maybe a hundred, not 10. Um, okay, so what's a tensor? So depends who you ask. So a tensor, we have the, Python tensor, right? And then we have the C++ tensor. So most of PyTorch code is in C++, only the surface is in Python. Uh, where we draw the line keeps changing, so people were pushing a lot more code to C++, now they are going the other way around and pushing more code into Python because uh, machine learning users are more used to Python, so they don't know how to go down to C++. Anyway, a lot of the code is in C++. Um, and there are also bindings for other languages on the uh, Python. But what I want to show is that, so the tensor is a reference counted uh, implementation, which allows us to switch implementations. And a tensor as a storage, the storage implementation. So a tensor is essentially, it's a view. So it just tells us how to interpret the storage. And the storage is essentially just a blow of it. Um, and so the tensor will tell us what's, what are the dimensions, what's the data type, um, um, how the, the, the strides, for example, and I think like that. Um, as I mentioned, so we can replace the tensor implementation and there are multiple availables. So you can have dense and sparse. You can also have a, a batch one, which is actually our, is a concatenation of multiple tensors. Um, so, and you can do your own there as well. So that's essentially a tensor by Torch. Uh, the creation of tensor. So I just wanted to give you a few examples of what's going on. Uh, when we create completely new tensors, right? So of course we need to, to, to create new tensor, test implementation, storage, storage, implementation. Right. Uh, when we do some uh, functional operation, then uh, of course we also need to to create new tensor, test implementation, storage, storage, implementation. When you do in-place operation, you know, we just need to overwrite the data that there's nothing new. Um, this two operation is, is funny. So the semantics of this line is that it will uh, check first if the um, if tensor X is already flow type or, or not. If it's already flow type, it just returns an alias to the input. If it's not, then it needs to convert and, uh, and returns a new tensor. So um, if X is already a float, you just done the reference code. Um, and transpose, we have seen before, it's just a new, it's a view, so it, it shares the storage and creates a new test. 
Okay. I think nothing surprising for this audience. Okay, so now let me show you what happens when you when you run some PyTorch function uh, in Python. Um, so PyTorch as a dispatching mechanism, you can you know like uh, you can think of it like a uh, C++ V tables, Java V tables, something like that. Um, it's slightly polymorphic, but so uh, what the dispatcher gets is it, it gets the operation, which in this case is add with the tensor type, right? And then um, it also gets the location of the of the inputs. In this case, they are on the CPU. <coughs> There's also some uh, global state, doesn't matter for this example. And then we have this wonderful dispatcher. And how it works is that it will stop once it finds one handler that wants to deal with it. That, that handler can either uh, do something and continue for the next one or just, or, uh, just uh, produce an error or, or just uh, handle it and return the, the result. So the PyTorch has a lot of, uh, of these dispatchers. Um, Autocast, for example, can autom will automatically convert 32-bit uh, floating point operations to 16-bit uh, floating point operations. Uh, magically, it, it decides which ones can be um, Made with less precision. There's a tracing mechanism, which we'll see in, in a bit. Um, creation of gradients, and then finally we have the hardware. Okay, so, and th this is just simplified view of the pipeline. So, in reality, they're actually way more uh, in this pipeline. So there is some overhead going on internal. So what's available today to speed up PyTorch? So we have a bunch of single device optimizations, which we'll see in the next few slides. Um, as I mentioned, this is Apex or Autocast, which automatically drop floating point precision, which is important transformation. And then we have multi-device um, uh, frameworks, um, which will not go over in this talk. Yeah, it's um, orthogonal into this one. <clears throat> okay, touch script tracing. Uh, the idea is, if you have a function, right, that is uh, that consists mostly of tensor operations, right, then you can ask PyTorch to execute the <coughs> sorry, to execute the trace. Uh, sorry, to execute the function with some representative inputs. And then it records which operations uh, that that were run during uh, that function call. So we we create two tensors, WZ, and then we ask PyTorch to run the function F with these representative inputs. And then it gives us some SSA based IR, um, which in this case looks very similar, um, which is then optimized and so on and, and can be run more efficiently. <coughs> the caveat is that it, um, it is this notion of representative input. So in this slide, we have the R Adam optimizer, which is a pretty common these days. Um, and you see it has four paths, right? Because you can go inside the loop or not, I'm sorry, inside this if or not, or not go inside the if, and then times going on then branch or else branch, right? So we have four paths through this function, right? But now we have, when we trace the function, we pick representative inputs, um, which means the you know, the function will be executed through a particular path, not the four. So um, if we ever execute the function again, 
with uh, inputs that would go through a different path, then Torch Script will give you the wrong result. So um, Torch Script only supports tracing with functions with a single path, or that all you know all the future inputs go to the same path as the representative. And if they don't go, uh, Torch Script won't give you any error or or any warning or something because it technically the way it's implemented, it's it's actually impossible to produce that warning. Um, so it's a uh, it's a uh, for functions where where it works, it, it's good, so it improves performance. But in general, um, it's it's not safe to use, right? So I never recommend this option to any uh, data scientist because it, it's very easy to shoot yourself in, in the foot. Um, the second option that TouchScript or offers is this com compilation, and the idea is that it it reads the um, uh, AST of Python right for a given function and it tries to generate the same IR that we saw <coughs> from this uh, AST. Uh, but of course, it doesn't support a lot of Python features uh, because it's a tensor compiler, right? It's not a generic Python compiler, so you cannot give your whole model to the script and pray that it will. It will compile because it, it won't, right? and that's by design. So it can only compile you know small functions with mostly tensor operations. Okay, but that's not realistic because a lot of the real code bases uh, they are quite Pythonic. They will use lambda. They will use you know complicated things, and the, those things will never really work with with touch script unless we turn on Touch script into a Python compiler, uh, and they don't have forward. So, uh, my claim is that right now there's really no good solution to speed up PyTorch. So, we have this Touch script that are too restrictive or unsafe for real world code bases. Um, Apex Autocast. This is just magic, right? So uh, they work with a predefined list of operations that the authors believe they are safe to be run with a lower precision. Uh, it, it's a fixed list. There's no check. There's nothing. It's just a list. Um, and then these that I didn't cover for for multi device, uh, they are very manual, very manual. So and they're really hard. To to, to use, so most users can't really use it. So, question is like, it's just like, is there any hope, right? So, it, it, is Python just inherently inefficient that we cannot do any better? And of course, the answer is no, right? Otherwise, I wouldn't be here today. So, this is Dochi, which is the tracing JIT compiler that we have been developing um, in the past year, let's say. So the key idea that makes this work um, uh, feasible is that most tensors are not observed, right? This is very important. So uh, if we look at this simple program, right? It's just a function from the tensor x and y to some output, right? The intermediate values of w, right? So they are never observed by the program. And so the compiler can choose to not compute them, to compute them in a different order, whatever. Like it, it doesn't matter, right? Just because we are offering the semantics of straight to execution doesn't mean that we have to do straight to execution only for tensors that are observed. And tensors are only observed when you have some data access. So when you have some branching based on the content of a tensor, for example, when you do some printing and uh, and some PyTorch functions internally also query the layout, whatever, 
for uh, as an optimization, but it's really a hack. So I think we can ignore that part. And what uh, observation is by the program is really like printing and branching. And, and that's it. Everything else is just accumulating uh, temporaries on top of the previous temporaries. And so the idea is, OK, why don't we delay execution until observation? Seems pretty obvious. Um, and that delay is called the tracing JIT compiler. So instead of going straight to the GPU, when we are when Python tries to execute these operations, we write them down on a trace, right? And then when you see the print, you say, oh, stop. This is an observable event, right? So now at this point, we really need to have the contents of X. And only at this point, we go to the GPU and ask it to produce the result, and then we bring it. OK. So tracing JIT compilers were quite successful for certain languages, and JavaScript comes to mind. Um, and they allow us to pick a bit into the future, right? Uh, since execution is delayed, now I can see many operations together rather than just seeing one <coughs> one uh, operation at a time. And we can also detect which tensors are temporaries, right? Because um, actually, this is nice that Python is is reference counted language. So we know straight away when a, when a tensor goes out of scope. And that means that um, it cannot be observed by the program ever again or, or ever. Right. So uh, we can mark that tensor, you know, a trace as as a temporary, and um, having variables as temporary is super important for optimization. So they they make it um, they enable optimization. They allow you to rewrite the code um, much more easily than if you think that every single um, value might be observable by the program. And of course, we can then play all the usual tricks of optimizing traces for execution in the background and, and so on. Um, and traces repeat a lot. So I'll show some numbers later, but you know, traces repeat millions of times, so we can uh, amortize the cost uh, of optimization. And best of all is that it, they work with any code base. And like all the previous solutions that I've shown, all these torch scripts and so on that require you to essentially rewrite the model. Uh, uh, Torchy, you know, just just doesn't require any code change at all. Um, so uh, just a high level picture. So the idea is when in Python you, you have some torch um, function call, right? It produces an event in PyTorch, and Torchy essentially um, is a plugin for PyTorch, and it intercepts all these events. And and there are essentially two kinds of events: the events just just, just append something to the trace, right? Or which are basically new operations. Or we have uh, uh, observable ev events like fetch like fetch the tensor data. And in this case, we essentially need to go to the executor, take the trace, compile, compile it, and then go to the packet and execute. Right. Um, fairly straightforward. <clears throat> okay, so how do we do it uh, in practice? Let's let's go back to the dispatcher, right? So remember that there's some global dispatcher state. And how we set it is we require the program to do torchy.enable. Okay. And this just sets this include dispatch key to torchy, which means that all um, like the algorithm, like dispatch algorithm from now on will consider will consider this torchy um, key. And the effect is that um, essentially we break the connection there and we set torch here um, 
So all operations will do the first few things and then they will stop here. Um, and we just dump it to the trace rather than executing straight away. And then later when we need to execute the operation, we will resume the, um, the next few steps. And of course, then we can use any backend available. So there are actually many backends that can compile PyTorch, uh, like small PyTorch programs. Um, especially these days, there are a lot of compilers that can take Torch script as input. And actually what we do is that we produce Torch script IR from our trace. And then from there, you can use a lot of existing backends. Also, a good thing is that the ABI, uh, the, the, the tensor representation in memory is equal pretty much for everyone. So if it's dense, everyone re represents in the same way, right? And if it's sparse, there are just a few formats that everyone uh, understands. So uh, you can mix and match backends pretty, pretty easily, which is not true with other kind of applications. Okay. Another technicality in PyTorch is that not all events go through the dispatcher. Um, so what we had to do is we had to replace the transfer implementation with our own implementation. Because for example, when the program calls print, what it shows up is it shows up as a call to the storage uh, here in the C++ world. Um, and so to intercept this kind of method calls that are virtual here, right? So we have our own implementation that just checks whether the tensor is materialized or not. Uh, so if it has some storage, and if not, it just uh, flushes the trace uh, and then uh, acts normally. Okay. And we may ask ourselves, you know, why? go to the trouble of building a whole new tracing compiler rather than just uh, improving TorchScript. Because TorchScript is actually, it's it's the closest that existed by Torch to uh, a real solution to speed up uh, programming execution. But the deal is this mantra of using a single data flow graph to represent a whole model, it doesn't really work anymore, right? Because as models get more dynamic, um, you know, you can and and with control flow, when you cannot put you know you, you cannot represent this stuff in single like in a single data flow graph. So while data flow graphs were a, a great tool in the beginning and they were really a, a good fit, right now they are, they are not anymore. So we should stop using this uh, single data flow graph uh, uh, idea that was useful in the beginning, but not. But not. Um, and, and of course, once you start <coughs> with addressing JIT, of course, then you get all sorts of statistics, which enable you to do uh, more uh, optimizations. You can trace across friction boundaries and so on and so forth. <coughs> so um, addressing JIT makes sense. Um, and is actually complementary to what touch group offers today. <coughs> Sorry. Um, so we do have a working prototype. <coughs> Sorry. Uh, we have a working prototype, so I'll show you some early results. I'll start with some micro benchmarks, which Essentially, these are just uh, simple functions with 8 to 32 element wise operations, and then that are applied to square matrices, and then we keep increasing the size of the matrices. And then we try with control flow and without control flow. Okay. And here are the results. So the line is basically. Uh, PyTorch vanilla, so it's speed up one. Um, and then we see that as we increase the number of flow, um, 
in terms of operations, right? And and the size of the operands, then of course the speed up increases. That's what we expect. Um, and we see, for example, here we get a speed up of for of around twelve x. Uh, so can you imagine the last time you saw a compiler getting a twelve x speed up? That's <laughs> that's not common at all, right? Um, as a comparison, we also include the results for touch script. Uh, because these functions, we could write them uh, um, as Dodge script as well. And so we perform very similar to Dodge script in the micro benchmarks. Also, because we are using the Dodge script, um, so NNC is a Dodge script uh, fusion algorithm, which we are using the, the same. So it, this is expected. So this is just to show that. Uh, we get the same benefits um, as a tool that allows you that forces you to re rewrite your code, and we get the same kind of performance, but without requiring you to rewrite your code. Furthermore, once you had control flow, which is this last uh, example, um, we outperform Torch script a lot. So here we still have our 12x speed up, and Torch script is is here, right, with a 3x speed up uh, over baseline. Right? So we outperform uh, the touch script by a lot, right? By like four, four or five x. Right? So, um, and models are going into the direction of, of having control flow. So the, the, this last example, that's where we expect models to be in the next you know, one to three years. Uh, so uh, overall, I think the results in the micro benchmarks are very encouraging. But of course, the world is not micro benchmarks. The, the world is real benchmarks. So now we turn to uh, some standard um, image processing benchmarks. So these ones from Torch Vision, and then these ones from Hiking Face are standard text processing models. Okay. These are and they may not be the state of the art, but they are, but they are very close. So, uh, state of the art models are usually variations of one of these. <coughs> okay. And we start by showing you how BERT, which is one of these text models, looks like to our compiler. So this is the way in initialization. So it's not really interesting. But the model itself, this is the control flow graph of the whole BERT model, where each circle is a trace, okay? And the errors are where uh, indicate the successor at runtime of that trace. Um, and so this trace T15, for example, um, depending, like sometimes would jump here, sometimes would jump there, there and there, right? So it, it has um, five successors. Um, that would pick at runtime. So the point is the dynamic control flow graph is super small for for BERT. And <coughs> let me zoom in. So here on the left is the diagrams from the BERT paper. Okay, and I'll show you that how actually what we see from the traces match perfectly what's on the speeches. So this is a, the zoom in from the uh, from the previous slide, and here we have the embedding, which uh, on the picture is here, right? It's embedding, and then then we have the uh, attention head, which you, you see there, um, and then the normalization here. And next slide, you'll see that this thing is actually um, yeah, fit forward, and so on. So actually. The traces actually align pretty well with the blocks <coughs> that are on the, on the paper, which is pretty cool. Um, um, and if you see, like, this is the zoom on the attention head. And if you look to the operations here in the, the attention head, are exactly this. So here you have this, these linears, and you'll see that they show up here. You have here one linear, two linear, three linear, which are which correspond. 
correspond to this feeling as here. Um, so, so it's pretty cool. I mean, uh, it's 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 exactly what's in the paper. That's exactly what we observed on the, uh, on the trace. This is the second part. It continues normalization for attention and the output. Um, one interesting thing to note is that these two traces are almost the same, right? They change only in one constant here. So here we have a view with a five, here we have a view with a seven there. Right? Because we, in this case, we have chosen to use, to pick the constants in, 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 in the trace. Right? Now the option would be to make constants, um, mix or some of the constants as inputs. Right. But here, since we use them as part of the trace, then we get these four different traces that differ only by this uh, number. Of them. Okay. okay, some early results. Um, so this is speed up one. So what we see is that actually um, we don't get any improvement. <laughs> uh, and and it's worth for the for the image models, which we'll see why next, why the text models actually perform better. And one of the reasons that we don't see any improvement is that um, this NNC algorithm, which implements uh, uh, operation fusion, is not very good. So it, it, it only supports elementalized operations. Uh, for example, it doesn't support batch multiplication, which is used in all of these benchmarks uh, and so on and so forth. So uh, the benefits that we usually get from, uh, from getting a, a sequence of operations, which is, okay, we can do fusion now and scheduling and all these things. Uh, we are not ripping, um, we are not collecting those benefits because this NNC is not good enough. Okay, but that's one of the reasons. Um, uh, and the other one is that, of course, PyTorch already has very specific operations for these models, right? Because since these models are very popular, developers have operations that are specific for these models um, to make them faster. Right? But still, I think the results, especially for text models, are not that bad because at least they show us that the overhead of the G compilation is not too bad, right? So we are pretty close to one. Um, okay, so how many traces do we get? How many unique traces? And if we don't do any shape inference, type inference, is the number of traces. And now you see, you start here, you start seeing here the suspicion, right? Why the text models have so many traces where the Sorry, the image models have so many traces, but the text models have so few. Um, but uh, keep that question in your mind for a little longer. I'll just show that if we do shape inference, then we reduce the number of traces considerably because now the traces become longer because um, sometimes the, the traces are cut short just to because we didn't have the information of the shape. And we would need to compute the results just to know the, the shape. But if we do shape inference, then we don't, we can delay flushing the trace uh, uh, a little longer. So we get we get essentially less than half of the traces if we do some shape inference. So here is one of is the explanation why we get so many traces with the uh, image models. And we get the usual problem of trace explosion. So you see here that we get a lot of traces that are equal model the constant, right? And we didn't implement the optimization, which would be in this case, just pass the, like move the constant to uh, arguments, like to them did explosion. And, and since we didn't implement that, then we get this, this crazy explosion. But this is one of the reasons why the performance with these models is so much worse than, than with text models. And why do we get so, so many traces? 
um, useful thing to look at is why do we, we flush trace? Why do we need to cut the, the, the trace short? And what we want ideally is this uh, storage to dominate because we want to flush the trace only when someone asks for the contents of the trace. Right? So if we do shape inference, uh, you see that for the text models, the ship, the, the storage information sorry, dominates, which is exactly what we want. And before we had a lot of requests for uh, this green is number of dimensions of the tensor. This is whether the tensor is, in, is contiguous or not. Uh, this is uh, the shape information is right here, right? So um, doing shape information, uh, uh, so doing shape inference actually helps a lot, right? as we can see. For the um, image uh, models, we see that our shape inference is not particularly good. So there's still a lot of is contiguous here. Uh, about half of the reasons are for is contiguous. One of the reasons is that we didn't implement um, shape inference for some key functions that are used in these models. And uh, so, and again, this also contributes to the performance of the image models being worse in our benchmarks than for the backlog. But, but anyway, these are interesting numbers just to see that it's possible for the current benchmarks to do a good job with shape inference and 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 they have you know, this picture dominated by um, storage data, which we cannot predict, right? We cannot predict the result of a tensor without computing. Or I mean, maybe in some cases you could, but not in general. Let me also show you the impact of shape inference on trace sizes, which is also interesting. So we see that without shape inference, uh, the distribution of trace sizes is very close to the left. So we have a lot of one of traces, right? And even uh, five of traces, etc. Um, when we have shape inference, you see that uh, the data is now much more skewed towards the right, even if here some a lot of traces that have uh, 37 or 38 operations right um only with the image models which are um which are here then we keep having um uh, one of traces and again this, this explains why these image models at all a lot of those so ideally we want uh, the distribution to be very on the right and even further than what we have here. But 30 something operations is already a very good number for fusion, right? Because after some point, uh, you know, there's very diminishing returns for every more operations. Um, okay, just to conclude, I've showed you the Torchy. Um, which is this JIT compiler for automatically uh, accelerating PyTorch programs. And because current tools assume that models can be re represented at a single data flow graph, and that's not true anymore. So we need solutions to uh, overcome these limitations and to support uh, more recent uh, kind of models. Um, and so the uh, idea is that we convert these dynamic programs into smallish um, straight line programs, which is what we call traces. And compilers love op optimizing straight line, straight line programs, of course. And yeah, and it optimizes uh, each trace. It can op run each trace with a different backend and so on. Uh, and there's, there's zero code changes. You just do pip install and that's it. And um, yeah, so this concludes my talk. So I'm happy to answer any question you, you may have. Yeah. Thank you for, for the talk. That's <laughs>